So hello, Robert. I'm so excited for this conversation because, I mean, usually I flow with everything, but for you, I had like so many questions that I, you know, I feel like this will be a really, really amazing and expanding conversation. And you do so many amazing things that I feel like it's impossible for me to introduce you because you do everything. But if you, if I would have to point it down, it's basically you explain the magic behind everything that I um, try to make people understand about the universe in a really scientific way, but at the same time, a really magical way. So go ahead, introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. My name's uh, Robert Grant, and um, I'm, I'm here in my home office today, and um, really looking forward to this discussion. And, and hopefully we'll be able to cover some topics that are, you find very interesting. And so looking forward to this. But yeah, I, I work in many different fields. I, I spent most of my career as an entrepreneur um, and I am not um, your, I guess your, your normal person or if there's such a thing as normal, but I'm not your <laughs> average uh, person, you know, because I, 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 I was previously a pharmaceutical CEO, which is kind of like saying, you know, when you go to an Alcoholics Anonymous course or whatever, and you sit down in the room and you say, I'm an alcoholic. Well, this is my case of saying this. I, I was a pharmaceutical CEO. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> and, the shadow. <laughs> right, like, oh, the shadow, right? So, so yeah. And, and you know what? I don't have anything really negative to say about, you know, people in the pharmaceutical industry, except that I don't think that the, you know, I, I think this is a good story for the whole world because in a way, I think everyone, te the, the popular zeitgeist is to believe that, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is evil and they want everyone to die for their money and all this type of stuff. And actually, it's not quite like that. I would say it's institutionally problematic. Mm. Uh, it's institutionally problematic, but it is not about the individuals in it. And nobody, I, uh, there's not like some like secret society thing you enter into when you go to become a pharmaceutical executive. Yeah. It's not like the mafia kind of. No, no, it's not like that. No, there's no like oath to Satan and stuff like that. <laughs> there's nothing like, but I think one of the things that I think is so important about what's happening in the world today is that each of us recognize that we all have an equal amount, and I really mean equal amount, of light and darkness in us. There can be no, you know, the light shines brightest, or in the morning, the sun shines brightest, you know, or the, the, the sun shines because of the darkest night. You know, it's like the, the light becomes very, very intense uh, just after, just after the, the dawn, right? Out of darkness, out of blackness. And I, I think that is <clears throat> something that's really, really important to remember that each of us, we all get stuck in this world of judgment. Mm -hmm. We all get stuck in this world of what's good and what's evil. Mm -hmm. And when I meet people that are in the sort of new age community and they say, you know, I'm, I'm woke. I'm woke and I'm going to do everything right. And I'm, you know, all my judgments are righteous and good. Um, I know that they're not really woke. Mm -hmm. Because to be, to be awakened, uh, if we use the term, really means to understand your own, uh, your own issues and your own shadow. And the shadow is a big aspect of the enlightenment and ascension process. Yeah. It's the most important aspect of it that we need to recognize that, that each of us, anything that we perceive in the world is really just how we want to see it, whatever that is, right? Yeah. And you could say, but I didn't want that consciously. Well, maybe you just wanted it subconsciously. Your soul, you know, and we are just the avatar of the soul and, you know, the soul wants to experience something and also the quote unquote negative, which is not negative because from a soul's perspective, it's just like exciting experience to learn. <laughs> yeah. Even the term, even the term polarity, you know, I don't really yeah. like the term polarity because it implies a separation when there's actually only an illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would say maybe differentiation mm -hmm. and, contrast, and, I, and I, kind of. yeah, yeah, or a contrast, yeah. right. To create contrast because we learn through contrast. We learn through experiencing contrast over and over again. If, if you know, you had never experienced pleasure completely, mm -hmm. or maybe only a very limited degree of pleasure, you would not be able to understand, right, an extreme degree of pain. Yes. So you have to be able to ex experience both so you can have context to put it up against. But then when you realize that there is no duality, that duality is not real. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, uh, I had this kind of interesting story when I, used to be a CEO at Bausch & Lomb Surgical, this, uh, this uh, you know, pharmaceutical company. 
And one of the people that worked on our management team uh, was based in um, was based in Thailand, and he had left for five years to go and become a country. You know, he was the country manager of Thailand, but he left to go become a Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. And he went on a sabbatical for five years, which is very rare in corporate, you know, America or corporate, you know, multinational corporation mm -hmm. type of thing. And it was very rare because when he decided he wanted to come back, we immediately put him back in his position he was in. And the person that had taken over after him uh, was very happy to have him come back because he had been his mentor. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating for me. So I, I ended up flying out to go meet with him and interview him. And I was excited because I'd learned that while he was on his sabbatical, he'd taken a five-year vow of silence. Mm -hmm. A five-year vow of silence. You've heard about these 10-day vipassanas, right? Yeah, yeah. You imagine five, five years. years? <laughs> I mean, what, what kind of like orchestra would you have going on in your head at that stage, right? Talk about a lot of self-talk. Yeah. It's, it's insane. And the whole thing is not only to be five years of not talking to anybody or not listening to anybody, but, but also five years of learning how to silence that inside your mind, right? Yeah. Because your mind's going to start really going kind of potentially crazy. But I so feel I like it's, it's to meet him. yeah, it, but I feel like it's also a really great opportunity to actually listen to the narrative in your head that tells you like interesting stories about the universe, because that's something that I really realized um, in my own process that, you know, we have Google inside of our head. Google is just a mirror of what's actually possible. We can ask any question and we have a narrative in our head that tells us the answer. And then oh, it's just yeah. a matter of trusting, you know, yeah. we can, as you know, you can, you can trust to Google or you can, you know, really be, um, you know, question what Google comes up with. And that's the same thing with the narrative. You can even, you know, get, receive an answer and then you question and challenge the answer. And that's how you grow and evolve because we, you know, we can just instantly think that something is true or we can investigate deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's how, you know, every great philosopher in this world probably came up with, you know, new concepts because it, it's just sitting with the knowledge that you have and then coming up with new things. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's part of your work too. It's just like you exactly see something important. and then you want to go deeper and deeper and deeper. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then listening to the synchronicities. Yes. And, and realizing that everything Literally everything is a message from your soul. Yes. <laughs> everything is. So interestingly, I, I walked up to this fellow who had been the Buddhist monk for five years and had been, you know, on this five-year Vipassana, I guess. <laughs> and basically, I, I walked up, there was a salad bar, and I started getting salad from my plate, which I'm sure there'll be no, no more salad bars now, probably because of COVID, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> That's the end of salad bars. I don't know what Vegas will do now, but... Um, but anyway, I walked over to him and I, I wanted to say hello, right? <laughs> it's like, because I was the first person to talk to this person, Fuck, right? that's so cool. <laughs> I know, right? So I'm like, I felt so nervous almost, you know? And, um, and, and so he didn't really say much. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> it wasn't like he started going blah, 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 like talking like crazy. He just looked at me and he said, I, I said, so how, what was it like, you know, to do a five-year vow of silence? And he said... He just looked at me and he said, there is no duality. Wow. <laughs> and you're like, I, was like, <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So what do you mean by that? Because I don't, I don't think I understood what duality even meant mm -hmm. at that stage, right? And he said, good and evil, light and darkness, it is only an illusion, mm -hmm. the illusion of separation. Yes. And... I remember really contemplating that on my flight home after meeting him. So I started writing down in my notebook all the concepts because I, I had this visceral reaction momentarily after I got over the, what does that even mean, right? Concept in my own mind. I then started to try to formulate it. And what could this potentially mean? Is there a metaphor here that I'm not understanding, right? Because I have this mind that is very, very curious. and I have to get down to root cause analysis. So I wanted to understand what is it that this guy meant? So I started writing down on my pad of paper, all the concepts that I thought would be considered dualistic. Mm -hmm. So starting from good and evil, right? Light and darkness, love and fear or love and hate, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then some words tend to branch into two different words, right? Yeah. Very often when we look at their an antonym relationships. Yeah. Then I started looking at words like 
humility and arrogance. And I started thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, is it possible that maybe they're just two sides of the same coin? And, and maybe as I started thinking about it, I'm like, well, I can think of people, the people that usually are very judgmental about other people's arrogance mm -hmm. are the most arrogant people. Yes. They just don't even have a clue that they're arrogant, mm -hmm. right? And they call out and judge what everybody else is that only they cannot see in themselves, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I was just uh, actually writing that in, in for, for the forecast for the equinox as well. Um, you know, many people blame in 2020, like the government, the system, like the world, like COVID, like they blame everything. And I'm like, I call people out. I'm like, yeah, but you're only judging all of these outside systems because you are not literally playing the part that you wanted to play in 2020 from your soul's perspective. Like you're not contributing to change at all. You're just sitting at home waiting for something in the outside world to change or to happen, COVID to end, the government to change, whatever, Trump to fall, whatever it is, right, that you're waiting for, instead of just taking action to creating change, right? Or, or maybe that action is something as simple as changing perception. Yeah. And opening to see other people's perceptions. Yes. And uh, one, I guess the good news is this, you know, I think a lot of people probably feel like, well, I'm not doing enough, you know, I'm not enough, or I, I should be doing so much more. They're sort of like the OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder that comes along with those that are woke, right? Yes. And, and I, think, I think to a certain extent, the good news I have to share with everybody is, well, at least from my own, my own viewpoint now, <laughs> and it's my own viewpoint, is that everything in advance. And there's not even an advance. That's the funny part. It's all happening simultaneously. Every according to a exact meticulous extraordinarily detailed path yeah. this is why synchronicities happen yeah. they're all planned that's actually yeah. a question that i had about synchronicities because you have been talking about that a lot and you know i know a lot of messages that i get is like people talking about angel numbers seeing angel numbers everywhere and because you are also like really involved in numerology and you explain the universe also from the numerolog numerological standpoint and like you know relate that to our dna um how important i guess are the messages or the meaning of the numbers when you see synchronicities in form of angel numbers like is it really because from my understanding of what i intuitively feel is like you know, if you see 666 all the time or 222 all the time, it's not necessarily that the number is telling you something. It's just that, you know, there is a repetitive number. Or also what I see is that it's just your reticular activating system seeing these numbers all the time. It's not necessarily a message all the time, you know? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because, um, well, let me finish a quick thought first yeah, yeah, and I'll come yeah. back to that. So, <laughs> so this idea that I was looking at Eric, Arrogant versus humility, right? Yes. And I noticed, wait a minute, I know people that claim to be so humble, they become arrogant in their humility. Yes. And I noticed that everything's actually a circle. It's not linear, mm. right? And, and to a certain extent, it's kind of like that with, with the earth as well, which is like, if you walk east one direction, you'll end up west if you walk all the way around the earth, right? Yes. Sorry to the flat earth people on this one, but... You know, <laughs> Everyone has their own different viewpoint and own different perspectives. Yes. Right? That's the whole point of coming here is to learn to expand. And that expansion is the enlightenment. That being able to see other perspectives than just the ones that, that you unconsciously believe benefit you. Mm. Right? So in, a, in another way, we are, or rather consciously believe benefit you. We all believe that certain things we do is because, you know, this is, this is for our benefit. This is for our benefit. And so then we know we're kind of in a conflict situation then, right? It's like, well, I don't want to give my judgment on something because it's obvious that I will benefit if that thing happens, mm -hmm. right? But actually, most of the time, we live our lives in a way where we are not even conscious that we're making that choice. Mm -hmm. So we are consistently making decisions every day. This is why most wars start. I was like, oh, you believe in a different God than I do. So therefore, my God, turns out, told me that he wants your land so that I can consecrate it to him. Yeah. And I'm going to kill you now to take your land. Yeah. And I feel like it's so good because I'm just following God, but it's actually not that you follow God because you have the same no. God. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. The thing is, is that you're, you're wearing a mask. Yeah. It's fake, right? Yeah. It's bullshit. And so what's happening right now is we're all waking up to all these different perspectives and we're saying, whoa, what's truth? Yes. What's truth? Well, the truth is, Perception. is that all of it is true. <laughs> right? We're all only able to see what we have defined as truth has been a very narrow, limited viewpoint on truth. Yes. We, have, we have all only been able to see one facet of the truth. Think of truth as a prism, mm -hmm. right? And each prism is its own facet. So everyone has their own reality. And how you perceive that, the, the degree that you perceive that expansion, right, or contraction or narrowness of truth mm -hmm. is going to define the experience you have here on earth. Yeah. And, and I think that is a really, really important thing to grasp. Mm -hmm. So, you know, angel numbers. <laughs> so here's a good example of it, right? Probably in physics today, the most challenging part of physics is to understand the concept of gravity, right? Mm -hmm. Because we only discovered gravitational waves in 2017 mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, you know, it was actually a little bit before that, but, but Kip Thorne, the, the physicist who was the person behind the movie Interstellar, uh, discovered gravitational waves, right? He got a Nobel Prize for that. Well, we're still far, far, far from understanding gravity fully. And it's interesting because, you know, gravity is a mathematical constant and the gravitational constant is 6.67. Now, it, it turns out that we don't have it very accurate. It could be 6.6 and 6.666 and some change, right? Or it could be 6.67 and some change. We don't know exactly, but it's really close to 666. Ooh, and that's a number that a lot of people are afraid of even when I'm like, there's nothing you need to be afraid of. It's not the devil. <laughs> well, when you, think of, when you think of gravity, what do we think of? We think of darkness. Yeah. We think of, you know, in French, we have the term, you know, c'est pas grave, right? Which is like, that's not grave. Mm. But, but we also say that, you know, Adam, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, that he obviously, after he blamed Eve and said, oh, you <laughs> gave me? And commanded I should remain with, she gave me the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I ate it. And then God says, Eve, what did you do? Oh, the serpent beguiled me, and I ate it, right? Yeah. That damn snake, right? Yeah. It's always blaming. So the moment we feel shame for things, we immediately tend to blame others for that shame, right? Because we, we don't want to face our own shame. Mm -hmm. We don't want to face our own shadow. That's why this year has been very, very difficult for lots of yes. people, because they've been totally awakening to their own shadow, right? And and their own bullshit, right? Yeah. And, and in, me included, right? All of us, yeah. all of us have. Yeah. And so, so basically we say that, you know, from the moment that God said that to Adam in the Garden of Eden, he says, okay, you know, from this day forward, you will have to work by the sweat of your brow, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna have to toil. And, and the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, this is before he did eat of it, he says, thou shalt surely die because time will begin. Right? So Adam fell and time began mm. in this concept, in this story. Whether you believe the story or not, doesn't matter. It's a metaphor. Yeah. So Adam fell. So what does gravity do? It makes you fall, right, to earth. It makes you fall down from wherever you were. You might have been in an exalted state, but you fall. Okay? And you fall into your gravity mm. and you die. Yeah. So time and gravity are inextricably linked. The two are connected. They can't be separated, right? So that's why in the movie Interstellar, when they landed on the planet next to Gargantua in the black hole, yeah. and they were there only for, you know, an hour, 45 minutes or something, and 23, 23 years passed on Earth and on the yeah. ship, yeah. right? So because there's something with a mass gravity or gravity time dilation, right, that relates to the mass of the planet that they're on. Yeah. So the point is, is that we think about gravity as this, we're always afraid of the thing we don't know. We're afraid of the thing we don't understand, right? We're afraid of the darkness. Mm -hmm. We've all believed that the light is good, right? And even some people think, well, the lighter your skin, that means the more good you are. No, yeah. it has nothing to do with that, right? And, and all of us have darkness within us, all of us. There can be no light without the dark, by the way. There's no differentiation. Mm -hmm. so, so this idea that gravity and time are the dark, mysterious box that we don't understand, we even represent it right? In, in certain religions, right, we have the, the black Kaaba, right, in Mecca, which is, 
what you know the 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 muslim faith basically circles seven times this giant black cube it's always the shape of this sort of cube and sometimes we associate it with saturn because saturn has a hexagon on top of it we'll, we'll say that that's a, a two-dimensional form of a cube right you can look at a hexagon either in two dimensions or in three so this darkness isn't it interesting that the gravitational constant is 666 mm. It's a black box, literally a black box. But and also, we, if we you turn it around, if you turn the number around, you have nine, and nine is like the number for me, at least of the divine, you know, and the nine explains everything. And that's interesting too, because if you flip it around, it's like, yeah, actually, the divine wants to come down in order to experience itself, right? It's all perspective. Yeah. All of it is perspective. So, you know, angel numbers are things that. And, and for me now, it's not even, I just, I expect it now. Yeah, right? exactly. It's normal, kind of, yeah. It's totally normal. We, I have this uh, chat group of, of mathematicians and physicists, and, and very often on there, when I'll post something that is, like, interesting, but I'm not quite sure why I'm posting it, and then I notice that the timestamp after I posted it, because I'm never looking at the timestamp when I'm posting yeah. I look at the timestamp after, and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> That was at 137, and I know 137 is, you know, the, the numbers of Yahweh. That's basically a math equation. 137, yeah. it's, the, yeah. it's the most enigmatic number in the universe. And so I'm like, oh, I better go back and look at that again. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that that came in at that particular timestamp might say something. Yeah. And, and I say might in jest in a way because it always does. Yeah. It always does. It could also be 111 or 222 or whatever these angel numbers are really just the way the universe communicates with us. It's a code. It's a code, right. Yeah. And so think of it like this, that the universe has a language. That language is mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't it funny that in school we're taught mathematics is so difficult and it's something that people really love to hate. They yeah. really yeah. love to hate it. Now, the good news is this, if you can hate something, that means you can love that thing. Oh, yes. If you can't hate something, then you're incapable of loving that thing. It's just neutral. You don't even care. That's right. It's like, it's like milk toast. Yeah. If, I'm, if, <laughs> if I'm really hungry and I have nothing else to eat and I have to eat milk toast, then I'll eat milk toast. Fine. Yeah. But I will never love milk toast. Yes. It's not what I would ever want to eat. But you may not like people that are triggers on your personality. In fact, it may make you trigger them to feel hatred towards them, right? Yeah. And that's how I felt a lot about Donald Trump in the beginning, right? Because I was like, oh, it drives me crazy until I realized the reason why he's triggering me is because I possess a lot of the same characteristics. Mm. And I don't want to recognize that. Mm. So I deflect by saying, I hate that, I hate that, I hate that. Yeah. Until I start saying instead, I am that, I am that, I am that. Yeah. Right? So when you start to when you start to notice then that when you're in high school, math is horrible. It's not fun, right? It's taught to be so difficult. And that's problem, it's part of the problem that we have with our systems in society today. I'm not gonna say anything negative about anybody anybody, but the systems, they just no longer serve. Mm. Right? We have systems of duality consciousness, we have systems of separation ideology. And I think we can move on from that. And one of those is knowledge is power. Yes. That concept, knowledge is power. No, knowledge is meant to be shared. And I, I, I think this is really interesting because the academic system likes to make it hard. Yes. I mean, I, I, I even watched a video yesterday by a physicist that I like named uh, Michio Kaku. And he was trying to tell people, okay, if you decide that you want to go into physics to young high school kids, you need to realize that you're probably going to fail because we as teachers, we simply want to fail you just to show you how hard it is. Yes. Okay. And I'm like, what? Really? Yeah. Because it's, it's, that it's, makes them feel bigger. It makes them feel stronger. It makes them feel more than they, than they believe that they can be themselves. 
And, and it keeps people in the system, you know, that's, you know, it keeps yeah. people in the system and keeps people in the feeling of I, I can not be powerful and my thoughts and my knowledge is not powerful enough. I always have to learn more or see, seek knowledge on the outside, basically, because they know better. Right. And yeah. one of my big missions is also, you know, to bring human design, astrology, like all of these things that even the conversations we have in to schools, because that's, you know, what we have to learn. That's, that's, the, that's the knowledge that we need to learn, you know? Totally. And it's interesting because I hated maths at school, but I loved it at the same time once I understood it. You know, it, like when you have the epiphany and you get it, it's just so magical how everything works. And it's interesting too, because a lot of my work with astrology is just analyzing cycles, right? And also I incorporate a lot of numerology, which brings me back to maths, right? And like how everything is interconnected. So even though I hated maths at school and I was not really good at it, it doesn't mean that I don't understand it. You know, I just didn't understand it in the way that I was taught in school. You know what? It's kind of like this. We've been trying to learn math and we've been learning it as an abstract idea mm. rather than a communication method. Yes. It's a language. Yes. It's a language. It's intended to be taught as a language. Yes. So I teach mathematics. Um, in, in a course that I teach called the etymology of number. And it's not taught in the way that you would have thought it would be taught. It's not taught the way I was taught in school when I went to school, when I went to university and when I went to graduate school. And I teach it as a language of the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because uh, I was asked by Nassim Hermain, a friend of mine, to give a presentation in Egypt in 2017. So I went to Egypt and I gave a four hour lecture on the language of mathematics. And there were about 200 uh, sort of mathematicians, physicists, uh, scientific community people there, almost 200. And I was shocked when at the very end of my presentation, more than half the room was crying. Wow. Because I was teaching, you would think, four-hour math lecture. I and mean, they're I, crying I, because of the frustration? No, because... Totally. <laughs> I thought they'd be crying, but not because they fell in love with it, right? Fuck. <laughs> And, and they were crying because they felt like, and I, many of them came up to me afterwards, that they had learned math for the very first time. Yeah. And that this was the way that they can now communicate with their higher selves. It's just the language of the soul. That's what math is. Oh my gosh, that's li literally how I refer to um, astrology. I always say it's the language of your soul. And for me, learning that and even helping people understand the code of their birth chart, for me, it's like coming home to your soul. And that's why I think it's interesting, you know, my idea, because you work a lot with vibration and numbers and the vibration even of um, the planets, like I would love to have like the vibrational code of your birth chart, if that, something like that would be possible. Sure. And then just play that, you know, like binaural beats or rife frequencies. It's just like playing that. And I feel like that would activate everything inside of you. I don't even know if that's possible, but that's, you know, when I knew I would interview you, I wanted to ask you that because- I'll tell you, my, my birthday is a, a very, of course, everybody's birthday is special to them. Yeah. But my birthday is uh, May 16th. Mm -hmm. And I always thought of May, because in many languages it's spelled M-A-I. Yeah. Right. It's just I am backwards. And uh, May 16th is the 137th day of the year, interestingly. Oh. So 137, it's the 137th day of the, of the leap year, which is this year. And uh, it's, it's also 5.16, right? So 5.16 cubed equals 137. So it's a very unique thing uh, for me personally. And what this, uh, you know, it's of course Taurus, and I was born at six o'clock in the evening. Which year, if I can ask? <laughs> 1969. And 69. by the way, you are the same birth card as me. Like we are both three of diamonds. I don't know if you fall, like there's a system called Cards of Truth. It's numerology and astrology. And uh, we are both three of diamonds. And that's interesting because, I mean, I know our birth chart, there's a lot about exploring the universe in a really deep way breaking the ego and like making sense of everything. And that's a big um, part of us. And it's also interesting because Donald Trump is the same. So we have the same birth spread and the same role, so to speak, in this universe of like really uncovering new values, even for the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. In the world today that, that I tend to notice a lot of are that trigger me both directions, right? Are mm -hmm. Donald Trump and Elon Musk. 
Mm -hmm. Those are the two biggest archetypes that we see. They get probably the most media attention than anybody on the planet right now. Yeah. And I, I find that interesting, right? I yeah. find it very interesting because we have to think of the universe as really just a projection of what's inside of us. It's not yeah. the universe, it's the you inverse. Yes. And so we see the universe through our own lens, right? It's yeah. our universe because ours is different. Nobody sees things the way you see them. Yeah. Nobody on the planet, our, our vision and our perception is as an individual as our iris. Mm. And, and I think that's really something that is difficult to grasp. But once you do and you start realizing I'm getting the same things over and over again, so maybe I should learn from those things mm. rather than blaming the government or blaming somebody else, right, for everything not being perfect. Rather, I'm going to now look at it differently and say, what's the lesson my higher self wants me to learn here? Yes. The universe is happening for me, not to me. And through so, you. You know, it, it's, like, exactly. yeah, it's like you are the universe and you are just like the universe experiencing itself through you, like through your perception. 100%. And that, that's just the game that you are, right? Exactly right. So yes, astrology works. Astrology is real. Yeah. The reason it's real is because it's all based on mathematical principle. Yeah. All of it is based on very, very extreme mathematics. And I'm not talking about numerology. It's funny because... You know, everyone thinks that mathematics is sort of the father of all the sciences, right? It's the yeah. one, the objective, it's the most objective. And yet, it is also the doorway to the deepest esoteric mm. understanding. Yeah. If you just look, again, like I, I know there's a video about the number nine, and how everything relates back to the number nine, and if you add everything up, and that's like a really esoteric video, if you look at it, it is beyond maths in, in the way that you would thought, think about maths, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean... And everyone immediately goes, oh, that's numerology. That's numerology. No. Well, because of that, quote unquote, numerology, I discovered the prime number pattern mm. and, and published it. And, and now that's in peer review with one of the top journals in the world. Mm. So, and I can predict primes infinitely because of it. Mm. So this is a major shift. Think about that. That's supposed to be the most difficult math problem in the world. Yeah. What you guys see is, is, is because... What I'm, I'm chronicling in a way through Instagram and through Facebook, my own personal journey yes. of awareness, yes. right? And, and as I find it, and I try to do it in a way that is both objective and heartfelt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I try to do it in a way that's balanced, right? Because where, where spirituality comes out is when there's a combination of, of logos and pathos. Mm -hmm. It's, it's when you start to merge with your soul and you start to understand that there's a bigger purpose. Yes. The universe is happening through us and yes. to us, yes. right? For us. It's not against us. It's never against us. It's yes. always for us. So I think those are, those are things that <clears throat> if there were one message I could get across, it's, it's to realize that we have been deceived by our own minds mm. because we are looking at the world in an imbalanced way. Mm. And once we start seeing the world through the balance, you know, I'll give you another good example of this. My first few months of quarantine were not good. Mm. I mean, I was, I don't know, probably a hundred Zoom calls into it. I was like, okay, peace out. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like sasuti, as they say in French. And, and I was like, this is no good. And I couldn't wait to get back to the office. Yeah. Like so, I you, you, so you basically wanted to escape yourself because you're like, I, I, I need to get out of my own like home. And that basically means right, it, it's a mental right. I, yeah. I could not wait to escape myself and yeah. realize that like that all of this was something that, you know, that I had to suffer and endure, hmm. right? It was suffering for me because I perceived it as such, but, but maybe that was the wrong perception. Yeah. Right. And so then then we, we came off of quarantine around my birthday. So right before my birthday, we came off of quarantine. And then like a month later, we went back again. Ah. You're like, fuck, this is the next test. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. But this time around was very different because I finally decided just surrender. Mm. Just surrender. And I changed my perspective on it. Use this time. You'll never have this kind of time again. 
use this time for what it's intended for. You need to go through this longer. So then I started to kind of relax. <laughs> Yeah. And I have a beautiful house. I'm lucky to have a beautiful home and I'm blessed with a wonderful family. And so I started just saying, you know what? I'm going to go swimming today. Yeah. And I started treating it more like I should have treated it the first go around. Mm -hmm. And it's been fantastic. It's not that I haven't done a lot of work. I have done work, but I haven't stressed about it. And I haven't been thinking, I can't wait to go back. I can't wait to go back. And now we're going back. And I have to say, I feel mixed. Like, fuck, I know I enjoyed his life. <laughs> In a way, right? Yeah. Hold on one second, I'll be right back. I just have to go turn something on. Okay. Sorry about that. So anyway, I, I, I decided, you know, this go around, I was just going to enjoy it. And I spent more time with my family. And I spent more time, you know, doing all kinds of stuff that I never would have done otherwise. Yeah. And I also found some solutions to some major math problems I didn't think I was going to find solutions to. Because maybe you needed a space, you know, that's what a lot of people don't see. Like we are so distracted and always on the go and always on the run. And sometimes we can't even receive messages uh, or come up with new ideas because we don't even have to have space. It's so interesting because I just started writing a book about, and a lot of the book is about the meta metaphor basically of, you know, the computer and how it's just a reflection of our minds. And, you know, sometimes you, you need to reboot the system or you need to just like declutter your storage because you don't have more, you, you can't literally download anything new just because your storage is so full, right? And you constantly receive the message, your storage is full. You need to extend your storage. Like our phones keep <laughs> telling us all the time, right? And it's well, interesting because yeah, again, we have to bring out or like literally delete all of the programs that are not serving us anymore, that, that, not are, that we are not even running, right? They're just in the background on autopilot and we, are, we don't even know that they take up space on our hard drive, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it leads to a, an inventory check mm. on everything in your life. Yes. And that's what it's been for me is that, you know, I started thinking, okay, I read this funny meme this morning that I took a picture of and, and I kind of go through the Instagram feed every once in a while and just see what other people are posting. And because yes. today was the autumnal equinox, right? Exactly. Yes. I was uh, interested to see what things were, you know, getting posted. Mm. And it was exactly how I was also feeling. And interestingly, you know, one of them said, if your circle of friends doesn't love and support you, no matter what you do, get a new circle, right? It's yeah, like, <laughs> create a new circle, yes. And, and that sounds like kind of funny and probably not really realistically, not realistic to some people, but actually it's totally realistic. Yes. And it is absolutely possible to do. What happens is we get used to these ways of looking at the world. Yeah, and safety. so we accumulate certain thoughts and people and furniture and baggage along the way. Yeah. Right. And, and it's funny because certain things that I was given by my mentors over the years, I'm only now starting to really understand the depth of it. Mm. I remember I used to work for this French fellow. I worked for a company called Coherent and his name was Bernard Cuyot. And, and uh, I, I come back from, Europe, I was the general manager of the European operations and I lived in Germany. <clears throat> and so I got promoted and came back to California, back to the San Francisco Bay Area. And I was 29 years old and I was the youngest like senior executive, executive vice president at the you know management level of the company. Mm -hmm. I've been a CEO for like 20 years about. And and so, but I was still frustrated that my career wasn't moving fast enough. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I wasn't good enough, right? I wasn't good enough. And uh, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge most people face in the world. But I feel like a part of a part of it is also for you personally, and I mean I can kind of relate to that too. It's because we feel we get the message already that our purpose or our mission on this planet is so much bigger. So we were like, oh fuck, like I you know, we, we still have the pressure inside of us and we feel still feel like, oh my gosh, there's so much that I want to do. I'm like so behind, but which is but not that's true. That's what I did. Exactly yeah. the same. Exactly yeah. the same. I dove right in. 
to my career. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to be the best I can be, right? Yes. And I'm going to be, you know, like the CEOs people read about type of thing. And I went diving straight into my shadow, mm. which learned duality consciousness very well. Mm. I could communicate duality consciousness. I could throw judgments out, even to the point where the Republican Party asked me to run for U.S. Senate. Ooh. And, and I said, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> Watch, now I'm going to get it for that. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, but, but basically, I said no, because I, 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 I learned the system. And, and I'm not affiliated with either, any party right now. I, I'm just kind of like said, OK, I'm not involved in that polarity consciousness anymore. Mm -hmm. So I literally don't even watch the news and stuff anymore. It was just getting mm -hmm. so it was upsetting, right? And even my friends in the new age community would say, you know, you can't just sit back and do nothing. It's like, no, I'm not just sitting back and doing nothing. They're like, well, you can't just sit back and teach geometry all day. I'm like, why not? Yes, you can. Why not? Yeah. There are 50,000 people that took that course, that took yeah. that class, right? And, and I, I think that there's very few things in life you can do that can expand consciousness like geometry can, mm. because you're speaking to your soul. You are communicating with your soul. So for me, you know, I, I jumped into that in my career and I got really good at it. And I knew how to negotiate. And, and those are all great things I, I, learned, I learned, right? And they've been practical for my life. And thank goodness, I'm very grateful for the, all the experiences of it. But really, it was a search for significance. For me, it was never about, it was never about making money. No. It it's never like, was about making money. I I'm, just felt like I had to live up to something. I'm not even sure what that something was, but I felt like I had some, some responsibility in some way, shape or form to make my life matter and count. And mm -hmm. my life mattered and counted even before that. Mm -hmm. So it's just my own wrong perception. It was like wrong, right, whatever, right? But mm -hmm. it was a limited perception, let's put it that way. I, don't, I like to try to stay away from what's right and wrong now if I can, even, even verbally and move towards a, you know, you go from a limited viewpoint to an expanded viewpoint. Yeah. And that's what I think is, is beautiful about this existence here and can be so great. So, you know, this guy says to me, this French guy says, he says, you know, Robert, you are very, very ambitious. You are very ambitious, you work very hard. You do everything, it's incredible. And a uh, very, very heavy French accent. And he says, <laughs> he says, but it reminds me like you are walking on this road. And the road is very long, very, very long. It's uh, in the desert yeah. by Death Valley in California. It's so hot, more than 50 degrees Celsius. Incredible hot, hot, hot. And he says, and you are carrying this very heavy bagage. Very heavy bagage. You cannot carry it. You try to stop to, to make a hitchhike. We can't even do it. And he says, why don't you drop the baggage and leave it on the other side of the road? Mm. I had no idea really what he meant. But now I do. And we all accumulate baggage. Yeah. We all accumulate things that we think are necessary, that we, whether they're friends or, or associates or, or business colleagues, we seek reputation, we seek and are concerned about what people think about us. Time to let it all go. Mm. You are good enough just the way you are. Yeah, and it's also realizing every single night when we fall asleep, we actually die. So we have the opportunity every single morning to experience ourselves in a completely new way. But we put ourselves into this box for all of our life and we feel like, no, we have to be a certain way the whole time when really we can transform. We can literally, you know, play and create a new character every single day. We, in life, we attract everything we judge mm. until we no longer judge everything we attract. And what do you attract then? That's the question. Well, that's really a big question. Because it's funny you say that because I was just thinking about that yesterday. Yeah. I, I actually believe that the purpose for this Maya, this illusion, this polygraph. Yeah is I believe the purpose of it is really that we learn to fall in love with it mm. just the way that it is. Like my idea, you know, and it's interesting because I feel again, like our life path also relates to, like I always wanted to find a way to explain the universe to some 
like to, to, to the world really, like to everyone, right? For really egotistical reasons, right? Because I want to understand it. That's why our, the work that we put out is really a reflection of our own journey, right? And we share what we came, came up with, right? And um, at the same time, I realized I also want to bring heaven, so to speak, down to earth because that's also an illusion that it has to be this rigid, physical, hard, Saturnian ruled world where everything is so yeah limited which is not true but you know of the first illusion of limit of a limit that we have is the physical body because we feel mm -hmm. like oh it separates us from 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 the earth from nature and it's also interesting because a lot of people are afraid of aliens quote unquote but actually we are programmed to think that we are aliens in nature because we are not part of nature right it's so interesting if you think about that yeah, and, and, and I mean, think about it. If you're a grasshopper, you live in a field, your universe is a field. Yeah. It's all perspective, yeah. right? If you're, a, if you're a monkey, you live in a jungle, your, your universe is the jungle. Yeah. You, you may know that there's an end of the jungle and you don't go there, mm -hmm. right? If you were in you know, 15th century Europe, your universe was Europe, but you know, there's nothing if you go, if you go west. So what's, what's there if you go west? Oh, the earth's flat. We're going to fall off. That's where the dragons are. Let's not go there. Everything is fearful when we go to that next stage of perception. And, and so imagine that if I lived in Arkansas my whole life and I'd never traveled, right? My universe could really just be that place. Yeah. I, I don't know what it's like. I can say to you what it's like to go to Alaska when you see the sky is so blue in Alaska because yeah. there's no pollution. And yet... I think, well, the sky's blue here in California. Well, maybe it's not even close to blue like it is in Alaska. You wouldn't. But that's my blue. That's my world, right? Yeah. So there's different zones of these perceptions. And so we can only know, you know, we used to have this, this saying in, in business. We'd say, oh, well, he, he's so fresh and so new at what he does. He can't find his ass with both hands, yeah. right? That's the term we say. We say, you can't find your ass with both hands. You can yeah. say that in Auf Deutsch out. Yeah. <laughs> Say it in German. <laughs> yeah, it's like, können Sie finden deine Arsch? <laughs> anyway, I, don't, I don't think it's a saying in German. <laughs> it's not a saying in German. But the point is that we don't know what we don't know. Yes. I used to tell people when they'd say, Do you, are you happy you went to MBA school? And I said, well, I was already quite experienced in business when I went to MBA school in my late 20s in like 27 years old. And I was like, because I didn't know what I didn't know. I would hear people talking a language and I didn't always understand the words in that language, like net present value and, you know, Black Scholes model and stuff like this that were just foreign words. And if you're not from that field, you would never yes. know. Yes. So what I did is I went to MBA school so I could at least realize that the curriculum, and I studied really hard, the curriculum I studied was the same as what everybody else learned. So I at least knew the language at a basic level, yeah. right? And that's what we need to learn now with mathematics. We need to learn the basic language. We need to go back, right? And, and test some of our assumptions because a lot of our understanding of math is just not right. Yeah. But the, 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 the great learning here is that if you can at least understand that there's a limit to your knowledge, there really is a limit to your knowledge. And you've probably seen me do this before. I don't have a, a cylinder here that I can use, but I can use this. You know, if I, if, I, if I basically show you this, you would think it's a circle. It might be even two dimensions because you're looking at me but through a circle. Yeah. Or you can see it this way as being kind of like a rectangle, but not quite a rectangle. It's a rhombus, right? Yes. It would be a, a rhombus. And if it cast a shadow behind me, you could say it's a rhombus. Well, mm -hmm. Two people could fight over whether this is a circle or a rhombus when actually it's a cylinder, right? Yes. And, and the thing is, is that as we go through life, the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. Yeah. And, and that's where going to school and learning and going through this exercise is so powerful because we realize the limitation of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that there's a zone outside of that. So multidimensional time might be outside of the zone of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. We're bumping up against these concepts that are very deep and big. And how do we have it touch us in our, in our soul and where we can connect with that soul. And that's what's such a powerful thing for, for me to see, you know, and I, I think yesterday I got a, a, a very new, and I, I just let 
people ask me all the time, how do you choose what it is that you work on? Same right. for me. It's like, and it just comes to you and you don't even know, but it relates to, to something that you experience. So you want to go deeper and deeper. And I just wanted to comment on like the, the before you go into yesterday, um, because the North Node for us all, like from the evolutionary perspective is we dive into Gemini topics, which is language, which is learning, which is education. And something that I already see with that shift, which started really in May this year, is that a lot of people go beyond the language that they use, you know, the, the language that we know, like words, right? We go into mathematics, like light language, vibration, like all of these topics come up to the surface now and I feel like that will be the new way of us learning and understanding the universe from a really right brain level I would say like an inner knowing like activating an inner knowing that we all have inside of us we just forgot it because of the you know right uh, left brain taking over and that's you know relates back to um, what I said earlier of decluttering the mind and the mind you know kind of like tricking us into thinking that all the, the all the limitations really and so it's interesting and I would love to ha have your perspective on that if you see like math but also like vibration as a new way of even downloading I want to say knowledge yes yes there's a field a morphogenetic field yeah and that field our brains are our radio receivers and our hearts are yes. the tuner of yes. the frequency yes so the higher the frequency that our heart is in from an emotional state perspective the better stations you'll be tuning into mm. of knowledge, yes. right? That's why people say to me all the time, and, and people ask me, how do you do DMT? How often do you take drugs, right? And I'm like, I don't. Yeah, you don't and need to. I'm like, hey, it's pretty funny to me that everyone like reads my stuff and say, whoa, man, you must be on so many drugs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm talking about the philosopher's stone, not the philosopher stoned, right? That's something totally different. But it, it cracks me up because, you know, I, I kind of got in an exchange with someone today. I'm like, look, not everybody needs DMT. Yeah. We all make it naturally. And I wrote back to him and I said, look, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I, I'm not against it. Yeah, I just felt no a, need a to do it. It's a fast track, so to speak. It's a fast track. And yeah. I said, I, I compare it to an alarm clock. Mm. right it's like not all of us need alarm clocks to wake up in the morning mm. but you know what when you're traveling especially or when you're really really tired and you've been asleep for a long time yeah. it's really damn nice to have an alarm clock yeah and, and dmt is like the alarm clock for me yeah. but don't get me wrong all of us have dmt in our own brains we can produce it yeah. it gets produced and the thing that's the biggest catalyst for me is geometry mm. so at a soul level we are just like a QR code reader. Yes. Right? With our eyes. We're not taking it in consciously, but we're absorbing it subconsciously. Yes. And as we absorb things subconsciously, it lifts our vibration. And we don't even know why we're interested in it. Yes. It's like, wait a minute, there's something about that. It's like giving me a tingle or something. It's like I got chills up my back, right? And, and those chills up your back, anytime you feel that, pay attention to it. These are all senses that we have been taught to ignore. Mm. right and, and it's not someone else's fault it's our fault for listening to it all right for accepting so, that yes exactly so for accepting that yeah. as the reality but maybe actually these are all extrasensory perceptions that we have yeah. and they in fact are they yeah. absolutely are so the, the the point is that you know i was working on this thing if you could turn on the thing i'll, I'll share something with you real quick and mm -hmm. we could probably end on this so let me share a, a screen. You know how to do that? Um, wait, just a you have to give me permission as the host. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I still wanted to go back actually, um, all participants, to encoding, so to speak, the birth chart. Can I do that? No, no. So now you should be able to do that if you have time. I don't know. Perfect. Yes, yes, I do. So I'm feeling that I should share this with you guys. So, um, mm -hmm. One, one of the new oh. countries, I just found it. Oh my so, God, um, so there's a very famous German philosopher, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and mathematician and geometer. And since you're from Germany, yes, um, I was thinking it can't be a coincidence that I'm sharing this. And it came up yesterday, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> That's right. And this is, this is the, this is the quote unquote, 
message I got yesterday to go into deeply. Uh, and of course, in this last 24 hours, which is the equinox. Yes. So um, Albert Durer. Now Durer was re referred to very often as the Leonardo da Vinci of the North. Mm -hmm. So he was from Germany, but he was a contemporary. He lived at the same time as Leonardo da Vinci. He was about 20 years younger. He was born in, in 1471. Da Vinci was born in 1452. Mm -hmm. But Albert Durer knew da Vinci, and he also knew uh, da Vinci's teacher in geometry, a fellow by the name of Luca Pacioli. Mm -hmm. And together, Luca Pacioli and da Vinci made the book called Divina Proportione, which is mm -hmm. divine proportion. Yes. And it's all these perspective geometries. Now, there's only one person in the world today that can draw perspective geometries the way that, that uh, you know, Luca Pacioli did, and that fellow by the name of Rafael Araujo. And Rafael makes books, and his geometry is like next, next, next level. So uh, he's one of my followers, and I'm one of his followers, and we're teaching each other techniques of this radical perspective geometry. And it is so powerful from a consciousness perspective. And you can look at his website and everything. He's, he's truly amazing. He's the best mm -hmm. artist. He's an architect. He's been doing it his whole life and he's known how to do it uh, since he was you know, a small boy without any training whatsoever, like past life type mm -hmm. of thing. But this person, Luca Pacioli, taught Albrecht Durer and da Vinci these radical perspectives in geometry and how to do them. They're very, very difficult to do. Uh, but among uh, Durer's work, there's a, you know, a very, very famous uh, image that's this one right here in the bottom you know, right corner. Yeah. And if I were to expand this, let me go ahead and just expand it down here. Okay. So if I expand this, you could see in this image, it's a very unique image, right? <laughs> it's yes. like, first of all, you've got an angel sitting there who looks down. The word melancholy means to be kind of like sad or down. Yes. Right? And you've got all these images on here that you're wondering, what the heck is this trying to say? The scale of balance. The scale and balance, right? Which is Libra, right? Yeah. And Equinix. <laughs> also represents light and dark, represents yes. duality. Yeah. You've got what looks like a gray sky, but the sun peeking out of it and a rainbow in the background. Yes. And you've got a time... Uh, you know, basically hourglass here. And an alarm bell next to it. <laughs> and an alarm bell next to it. Yeah. And then next to that is a magic square where yeah. everything is adding up to the number 34. All the rows add up to the number 34. And the angel doesn't look like a very happy angel wearing what looks like some sort of crown of thorns maybe or mm -hmm. something. Looks kind of depressed, hand down in his, you know, his face down in his hands. Then there's like this baby with a crown sitting over here, which that's hard to understand also. What does all this mean? Why is the ladder up there? And what, what is this bizarre geometry here that nobody has ever seen before? And a ball on the left corner. And a ball down here on the left corner and some, it looks like some weird, like old Renaissance period dog. Yeah. Um, and then in this geometry, you can see a face, a mask. Yes. This almost looks like a mask from the theater. Yes. Right, and then there's also a very faint one right on the side of it over here. It's yeah. hard to see in this picture, but in a very clear one, you'll see there's, there's two faces, just like a theatrical mass set mm -hmm. up here. Yes. So this has been a, uh, an enigma for a long time for historians, cryptographers, and everything. So I decided, I don't know what it was about this, but something triggered me about it. Mm. So mm. I decided to analyze this. And really have a name so I named it the Durahedron right? so and uh, some people have called it the Durer solid before and what I noticed is I start by first analyzing you know what are the angles of incidence inside of this and when I analyze this which is a job in and of itself but luckily with computers today you can do it it's not terribly difficult but you figure out that this is 128.16 and 114.84 uh, this doesn't really tell us a lot. It's close to one over pi times 360 degrees. 540 degrees, of course, is the sum of angles of a pentagon. Mm -hmm. So it matches the sum of angles of a pentagon. And, and then you've got 54 degrees here at the base, which is very interesting because that's a 10x relationship yes. here. Yes. 
Now, inside of the Vitruvian Man, 54 degrees is one of the things that really triggered me because it's the point at which the square overlaps the circle when you center the square over the circle in Da Vinci's work, okay? Mm -hmm. So 54 obviously has some significant meaning, which by the way, uh, in physics, 54 is very important because it is the length of the Planck time. And it relates to the number nine, if you add it up, it's nine. And it relates to the number nine. So all the numbers sum yeah. to nine. Okay. So I started analyzing this some more and I wanted to find, okay, I had drawn a, a particular new type of geometry and that's what I like to do is find geometries inside of Metatron's cube because every time I do, it's like gaining a new perspective on the world. Mm, yes. So every time I find a new geometry that's never been published or seen before, it's like, an and believe me, they're all very well cataloged and everything, right? But I've found so many in the past year that I haven't even named all of them. So I've, I called this one the Grand Tahedron, okay? Yeah. And what it is is squares, pentagons, and two triangles. Now, in order to make it work, because I made it in three dimensions, I also have a, a 3D printer right, right next to me, but you know, where I can make things like this. Oh, cool. You can see that, right? Yes. Um, and, and basically, I've made it, and what I found is that in order for it to work, the, the pentagon has to be this exact shape right here, yeah. which is a very unique structure. And I thought, that's interesting because it's an irregular pentagon, kind of like the durahedron has, right? So the durahedron has this right here, which is the scale of it. Yeah. And, and I was fascinated to figure out, okay, 54 degrees is also musical note A, 540 degrees is also in Hertz frequency, a C sharp. Mm. And then the angle that's here, when I separate this up into pieces, turns out to be 63 degrees. And then I also noticed some other aspects of this that if I took, you know, the reason why a pentagon is a pentagon is because it has a golden triangle inside of the pentagon right here with 72 degrees 72 and 36. and it's interesting sorry for interrupting you because it's like it relates to the finger of god aspect in astrology which is like to um 130 degrees aspect that is like a, an in conjunct and then that's you know um connected through a sextile which is the bottom and it's like a supportive right. aspect and again it relates to the finger of god so it's like a really faded aspect that is literally you know in astrology at least to you know it tells you it's something that the soul wants you to experience like you can't even avoid it right so, so here's an interesting thing okay uh, last week i did this podcast with uh with pete evans and and pete uh has got a lot of coverage in australia and so he sends me an email a few days later and he says hey l mcpherson wants to have a call with you so i said l mcpherson the supermodel and he said he said yeah and I'm like, man, okay. I never thought that, like, you know, I never thought that I'd be getting these kind of requests for mathematics, right? Yes. See, that's what's happening. The world is now starting to begin to fall in love with, with math. mathematics. Yes. And you're like, yes, finally, my time is coming. <laughs> and they understand me now. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't peak in high school, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so I had a call with El McPherson now. Funny thing is, I wrote back to him, I said, I've actually met El McPherson before because I lived in Australia for three years before I went to MBA school. And one day I was on the Sydney Harbor Bridge and I had to pay a $2 uh, toll to cross the bridge. And there's a huge traffic jam, right? To pay the toll and you go through. Well, there was a blue Jaguar behind me with a woman driving it that was uh, in a convertible. And um, next thing I know, this person gets out of her car and knocks on my window and says, excuse me, can I borrow $2, please? And so the $2 coin is an Australian coin, right? $2 coin, yeah. so I asked her, sure, take it. And it was Elle McPherson, and what? she's standing there in a bikini. I'm like, <laughs> this is a <laughs> joke. Is this? <laughs> this has got to be a joke. This is 1997, yeah. where she's at the height of her fame. And, and like, she, of all cars, knocks on my window, right? because I happen to be right in front of her. So I hand her a $2 coin and I then drive in to the city where I'm gonna give a presentation that night to a bunch of cardiologists at the uh, Park Hyatt Hotel. And she's driving behind me like she's following me, but she was actually just going the same place. Yeah. And we pulled in the valet parking and all the valet guys run to her because she just finished a photo shoot. So she was just in a bikini, how funny is that? 
and like all done up too. Like she's like super glammed up. And she walks over to me and she says, oh, you're the nice fellow that gave me the $2. Thank you so much. Can I buy you a drink? And I said, I said, um, you know, I have to give a presentation. Otherwise I would definitely go. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, I ended up having a call with her, you know, this, uh, this last uh, was it Wednesday or Thursday. And, um, and I had a Zoom call with her and the first thing, and I, of course, I emailed that to her. I said, you probably don't remember, but 23 years ago, you know, I'm the fellow that you got the $2 from. Yes. And the reason why it might be memorable is because uh, it showed up in the tabloids the very next day, like all over the place, yeah. right? So the paparazzi was behind her. So they photographed her knocking on the window. I actually have a newspaper somewhere around here That's of El McPherson knocking on the, my window of my car. For $2. For me, yeah. And wearing a bikini. So, so she gets on the phone on the Zoom call and she says, okay, I'm doing it. She goes, I can't wait to give you your $2 back type thing after two years. She totally remembered it. She completely yeah. remembered. Well, the funny part about it is that, uh, you know, I had a great call with her and actually I'm launching a podcast series starting October 1st and she's the first one I'm going to interview on this podcast. Oh. And, uh, and because everyone's waking up. So what I'm doing is I'm going to take all these people that you would never suspect that are from like mainstream walks of life yeah. and interview them um, yeah. as they're all going and they can tell their story and their journey, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is, is going to be really exciting for me to, to have them tell their stories. But, but basically uh, afterwards, I was talking to one of my friends and um, who works at one of, one of our companies also. And she says, you know, Robert, you need to look at the $2 coin. And mm -hmm. I said, why do I need to look at the $2 coin? She said, because there's something on it trying to tell you something. And so I looked at the $2 coin and the $2 coin has the Southern cross on it, <gasps> which is basically this cross right here. Yes. Right? Oh it's my like God. Oh, now I understand because I talked about the finger of God. That's why you related to that story. Right. So there's synchronicities everywhere. So I, I, I looked at this and so I was thinking, wow, this is really interesting. It's shaped like a yeah. diamond. Yes. But in this inverted view, it's the last Tau cross. And in Rosicrucianism, there are three crosses and, uh, and there's also three crosses within the Sephiroth, which is the, you know, the tree of life. Yes. But the root, right, is the most important and it's where the heart merges with the brain. And, yes. and that's what this is intended, I believe, to represent. Oh. So I'll explain why in a moment here. So, so basically what I did is I noticed as well that, you know, all these angles are showing up in here. And this angle down here, because you could say that this is forming this very strange isosceles triangle right here. And then you've got yeah. these two pieces right here. And then you've got a line that intersects across here. So what is this exactly? Well, guess what? This is the Great Pyramid proportionally perfect. Oh my fucking God, that's amazing. This is 51.84 degrees, exactly the slope angle of the Great Pyramid, which is what I found that 51.84 was embedded in the Vitruvian Man. And also the, the, pyramid, the pyramid relate to the chakra system, which again brings us back to even the human body. And Albert, exactly. So yeah. an Albert Durer, was a Rosicrucian, and Rosicrucian comes from the term Rose Cross. Yeah. The Rose Cross is the original name, the Ross Tau or Rose Tau is the original name of the Giza Plateau in Egypt. And it's also interesting because I had a client the other week and he afterwards said he feels called to share something with me and he sent me this, um, Basically, it relates to the cycle of Jesus and Jesus consciousness from the Rosicrucian fellowship. And I've never really heard about Rosicrucian religion before. And it was the 33.3 year cycle of Jesus Christ consciousness always coming back. And it was this whole thing. And it, yeah, which is interesting. So I'm pretty sure you associate something with that number anyways. <laughs> which, which leads me to this right here. Oh. This adds to 34, each of these rows, all yeah, the true. rows, which is R-O-W-S and R-O-S-E, all the rows add to 34 because it's the 34th degree. Oh. The 33rd degree in Freemasonry is the highest degree that people know about. Yeah. 
it's the phoenix stage yeah it's, it's the like the nine again yeah in my phoenix. course the etymology of number i teach the stages of alchemy mm -hmm. the negredo and alchemy is just you could think of alchemy as the advanced form of once you know astrology and you can read astrology astrological charts also yeah. which i had to learn which was really interesting but once you can read astrological charts then you can start down the magnum opus the path yeah yeah which is also part of geometry and mathematics there's a whole system to do this that's why the philosophers throughout time were always geometers yeah and even because, carl jung also used astrology you know oh absolutely yeah so so basically the 34th degree is the philosopher's stone mm. so you were just reading about the 33rd degree there's 33 33 vertebrae in our spine right mm. and then it comes up to the cranium the crown chakra we're in the corona the corona means crown wow. yes so it's not a coincidence as our crown is lifting so must we experience a lower vibration yeah. associated with it yeah. as Carl Jung said a tree can only extend its branches up to heaven if its roots can extend down to hell yes it's the duality right everything has an equal opposite condition so you just have to learn how to fall in love with this extreme mm -hmm. and I know it's not easy but that's the whole thing and once you realize that you can fall in love with this the universe is happening for you and through you not to you yes against you then you can start to experience this life here on earth as a paradise and it's also like i again like it's it's all about perception anyways but i i fall in love with every crisis that i have because i know that it leads me to such a big breakthrough and even deeper understanding of the lesson but also like the bigger picture of this universe so i'm like always excited about you know the darkness so to speak <laughs> that's why I, I in my readings i focus a lot on trauma and on you know pluto and the transformation and the evolution of the soul because we have to go into the, like the deepest moments in your life in order to alchemize it and find the, the light if you want to transmute say it, it. right yes. transmute it and so what this is here this angle here is related to alpha mm -hmm. and this angle down here is related to omega mm -hmm. so it's embedded right within this geometry this the proportion of this line versus this line is 1.2 times x which is the width here yes. 1.24 and 1.24 24 is the number of divinity and time because that's what the prime number pattern is based off of it's also you know the cubic dehedron has 24 edges yeah. and and all of the structure of space time is based on that 24. yeah so so then i realized okay what the durahedron is really showing us and telling us here is, and, I, and then I found it was hidden inside of the, you know, Metatron's cube as well, which is what I kind of found last night, which I was not expecting to do, is this represents, right, here's that 5184 angle right here. That's the pyramid. Yeah. So think about the pyramid on its side, yeah. right, where this would be the peak, and then flip this over, and it would be exactly the proportions of the pyramid like identical. Yes. So another thing pointing us to the pyramid and to the philosopher's stone, oh. which represents the consciousness that merges the heart and brain, right? When the heart and brain, when the left brain and the right brain can work together and the heart is merged in that, your heart has a brain in it too. It, it is a very, very, it's, it's super intelligent, just like we have a gut solar, solar plexus brain as well. But there's like a, a little ganglion mesh of, of brain tissue that's in our solar plexus. We also have some right near our thymus, which is the gland that's right, right by the heart. So this relates to the philosopher's stone, and it's all about this philosopher's stone and this last cross, the fourth tau the fourth Tau cross. So what I then did is, um, let's see if it comes up here. Let's and I'm bringing it back to that your birth card is a three of diamond. Of course, you create a new diamond in this world. <laughs> I get so funny. Right, totally. totally <laughs> so um, this one right here. So then I found it because I have to find it inside of Metatron's cube uh, to be able to really register it as a, as a real geometry. And here it is. It's part of the, the normal 
you know, you just find the center of these points right here, centers, and then this line right here, when you intersect over here, and then it will cross over at this point right here, you then intersect that line here. That's how you create this. But it's inherent to this structure. As everything in the universe comes out of this one cube of Metatron inside this hexagon right here. So, so basically now, you know, I'm going to draw this in, in all kinds of different perspectives, but this is the, the exact view on, on this and structure. It, it was almost 11-11 when you saved that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the message is stay on the path, raise the, the you know, the, the heart brain consciousness. Yes. The, the other elements of the picture, and I'll just do a quick interpretation for you and then we'll have to go. Yeah. Is I already explained the 34, and this is basically telling us about the 34th degree. That there are, and you'll also see here, it's hard to see in this picture, but this is the shape of an A and M, the design on the on the hourglass. Yeah, so morning. And and basically that's the I am. Oh yeah. So time and time dimensions is gonna be coming up heavy in the consciousness. So this morning I'm going with uh, with Alan Green, who's one of my good friends and uh, and colleagues, mathematician also, and we're both going to go and see the movie Tenet, mm -hmm. which is about time. Guys, it's in the public awareness, right? It's in the collective consciousness, time dimension. If you notice, so many television shows right now are about time mm -hmm. and about different dimensions of time. Yes, you know, life imitates art. And art imitates life. So, you know, this is what's happening. The, the artists are able to tap into these fields prior to the scientists. The scientists are usually the last people to get the information. Mm, yes. right? It's just the way that it is. Here's the alarm clock, right? And there's even a little string here that you can rope, pull on the rope to ring the bell, right? This is escaping out of duality consciousness, right, into the multidimensional self that this angel doesn't even know that it's an angel. It's just sitting down in depression and has no clue that it is the divine. Mm. And you could see this entire world as being incredibly dreary and, and uh, you know, dreary and sad. Maybe that's where the term dreary comes from. It's like dreary. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Yeah. So it's like dreary and sad and dark and black and white, not in color. And yet we have a rainbow here yes. that we can't even see. So it would take... Uh, extended perception to even realize what this is as a rainbow because we can't tell by its colors. Yeah. And then you have this duality and judgment, escaping judgment, getting rid of your own masks, that mm. this stone represents the philosopher's stone and the heart brain merger. And then right next to it is the ladder, Jacob's ladder yeah. to heaven. So we simply have to change our perception to realize you can look at this picture as a very sad, melancholy place, or you could look at it as heaven unrealized. Yes. So with that. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Definitely, uh, you know, we could talk probably forever. I would love to continue at some point because again, I, I have a lot of questions relative to astrology and even now knowing that you already know how to read charts, which is pretty interesting, um, would be a whole nother topic. But that was, thank you for sharing like, you know, something that you just downloaded yesterday, I guess, the night before we meet. So that's incredible. Let us know where we- last night. I didn't finish it until about one in the morning last night. Wow. Let us know where we can find you and get the latest updates. I will obviously link you everywhere, but you know, if you have anything interesting or exciting um, to share, definitely we'll do it again. And, and if you ever come to California, let me know. I'm here. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're in Long Beach today. I yes. forgot. Yeah. So I would so love to meet. Yes. Absolutely. You can, we, can, we can arrange that. Okay, cool. So I'm going to stop the recording now and um, everyone go check you out and um, you got to go too. We will definitely meet another time. And thank you so much for your time and uh, all of your insights. It was so, oh my gosh, I have to, you opened my mind up. I'm got, probably going to spend the rest of the day thinking <laughs> for sure. Okay. All right. Have a great day. Have a great day too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>